we're going to talk about commemorating 40 years after the October War and the uh, uh, glorious victory that uh, Egypt had uh, re is still rejoicing until now and we, Egypt is just commemorating uh, this uh, victory only a week or so and as we all know that throughout history uh, leaders have been taking decisive decisions that have changed the course of history late president Sadat was among those leaders he uh, uh, has done the unthinkable uh, at uh, very critical times and the decision of the October war was one of these uh, very critical decisions it was uh, very risky however Egypt uh, achieved success in this war achieved uh, uh, victory and retained one dear piece of land the Sinai Peninsula and also retained its integrity and pride also with it and today we remember this uh, war and we'll remember with our uh, prominent guest how was the preparation for that victorious war and how did the world uh, look at looked at Egypt and the strategic map was changed uh, after this war at what, what were the consequences of these uh, of this war and we'll also take some flashlights uh, from uh, this war and on top of all we're going to discuss the production of the military arms with our prominent guest, uh, Dr. Engineer Yusuf Mazhar, you're an industrial expert and photographer. Good evening, sir. Thank and you, let us first uh, talk about the preparation for the October 1973 war. How did it take place, especially that you are an expert in the um, military arms uh, production? Well, nobody is really an expert in everything, but uh, there are um, uh, principles and lessons that uh, were learned during uh, the wars before the October War. And of course, they all fed into what happened on the October War, but with much more um, cleverness and tact. That's why the amazing results, uh, which had not happened before, when actually the war turned in favor of Egypt. But let me say, you mentioned the word preparation, and uh, I think that's a very important uh, uh, word, because uh, wars don't spring up like this. I mean, if you, if you take the history of uh, wars all over history, history of Egypt, don't forget that when we talk in October, we must be talking about, uh, we must have in our backgrounds the wars that e Egypt uh, fought. Egypt fought during the Pharaonic times, fought with the great Pharaoh, uh, Ahmus, and uh, the, the Huxus, which were uh, raiders that came into Egypt and did not want to leave and stayed in the Delta, they were driven back. We have Ramses II who also uh, stood fast and also delivered Egypt from all the attackers from the east. Egypt is always prone and that's valid for our talk today. Either you attack from the east or you attack from the west. From the south it was very rare and from the north it's the sea. So. Uh, you must look at all that, and even after that, when the very good time of Muhammad Ali, where uh, Egypt had a modern army and, and uh, modern equipment and uh, reached all the way into, uh, all the way and defended Egypt against uh, marauders of that time, all this was preparation. I mean, the, the word is preparation. You can't just jump up and start the war. You, uh, you must always be prepared now. Preparation military, of course, we've got people who are more capable of talking about that. But I'm talking more about how to prepare for the equipment. An army, uh, Napoleon once said that army marches on its stomach. It's not only on its stomach, it's also on its equipment and its rifles, etc. So, number one, and since, since Muhammad Ali, during uh, his period here, started the first modern army, the emphasis was to have a military production inside the country where you could depend on it. So at that time, uh, he, took, he got French advice to get the rifles. He got British advice to get the cannon. I'm talking about 18, the late 1800s, where Egypt was preparing for, for war under Muhammad Ali. He got the uniforms. He made factories of uniforms. He even went to Tunis and got factories for the Fez of the Egyptian army soldier so that the army would be complete. Now, having these factories inside the country makes means that you can have 100,000 soldiers, you can have 120, you can have 150,000, 
And you don't have to reach out all the time and say, give me pistols, give me rifles, give me this, or give me, as we call now, RPGs, which are special, uh, let's say, things that can be aimed at tanks. So you must have a basic military production in your country. The military production means that you must have factories that make the arms. That means you have the equipment that shoots, but you've got to shoot something. It can be a shell. It can be a ballistic missile. These must all be produced in the country. Or else when you go into a war, after one week you won't have anything. You're going to not send help, help us, send us this. No, you must have that yourself. And to a certain extent, you must have um, equipment for the military, the soldiers, the infantry. But also, if you look what happened during the October war, many of the equipment was also made in two new areas. One is the air, uh, area of armed vehicles, and you must know that Egypt has got a very elaborate tank production. Of course, the tank production was done in cooperation with people who knew how to make tanks, but we have a tank production which produces most of the tanks. I won't mention names or the models, but most of the tanks now in the streets of Cairo yes. were made in Egypt. Many people don't say that. Well, okay, we can't boast that it was made 100% in Egypt. There are certain pieces of equipment that has to come from the mother donor of the technology. The troop carriers, these little uh, carriers which people call tanks in the streets of Cairo, but these are the ones that are actually holding Cairo at the moment. The bridges now are guarded by these troop carriers. They've got a number of, uh, of uh, troops inside. They've got a machine gun on top, they've got other guns. These are all come out of the factory, within arm's reach of Egypt. Well, sir, along the same lines, can I also ask you, um, how do you assess the technology that was used in the October war? Along the same lines as you were um, speaking about the... Look, uh, rephrase the question again so I can give it how a How can you uh, personally assess the technology used in the war? Well, uh, the October war. Yes. Look, uh, first of all, there are, in a war, you've got many things. You've got tactics, and this is the job of the military. You've got surprise. You've got also equipment. Uh, the equipment, after Egypt had a bad luck with the two previous wars, it was very important to build up all this tremendous amount of background equipment. You need planes, you need tanks, etc. I think during the, the war, Egypt was quite well armed because uh, all the efforts before, when the canal was out of our control, when uh, we had the bar left line on the other side, then you could not move very fa very much. You could skirmish. But then this was the time that we built up all our capabilities. We built up, built up our air force by buying the things that needed to be made. We built up our tax, tanks. And we built up the Egyptian soldier with a very simple RPG, which was a, a weapon where one man could attack a taxi. So there's something very important in equipment. You don't have to make a bigger tank than the tank in front of you. If you can make a piece of equipment which is maneuvered by one man at very little cost, and it can penetrate the armor of a tank, and this is what uh, got us to, to win the tank battles. The tank battles on the other side of the canal uh, are witness of that the Egyptian soldier with a very simple uh, tank penetrating device, an RPG, which is fired the rocket in, managed to stop brigades of tanks. I mean, there is one case, uh, there was a graveyard on the other side of the canal. Of course, this did not get enough publicity. Uh, but the, the burnt out tanks, people who went to Sinai, even civilians, so many, many tanks from the enemy destroyed. They were not dis destroyed by a tank-to-tank -tank battle. They were destroyed by another. So when you come to arm an army, you mustn't necessarily go and get the same thing. You maybe you can get something which is, um, uh, let's say, much better, much easier to, uh, to to manipulate. So all these things were made in Egypt. The the tank factory that we have is a very up-to-date factory. Right. If I can get in here, if we again take a flashback to this uh, uh, glorious war. Uh, we could also, we cannot deny that we were fighting against one of the best armies in the whole world, which is the yes. Israeli army, backed by a superpower. Yes. Always, all yes. their lives they were backed yes. by that superpower. 
Uh, and uh, we remember uh, the former uh, Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, when he had concluded several meetings with President Sadat later on uh, to prepare for the peace treaty. His observation on that leader is, is that this is a man of peace and war. Yes. He uh, uh, defied all odds and uh, launched a war when everybody else thought that he would never launch Correct. and uh, launched for peace with the same enemy that he defeated badly. Yes. We remember the infantry uh, uh, soldiers who each one of them almost uh, scored like more than 25 tanks. Yes, exactly. We That's remember the, the, the people, the, 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 uh, the leaders or the majors, the generals who uh, just uh, had some ideas of using water cannons to bring down the Barlev uh, yes. line. So. Uh, doesn't that uh, reflect that Egyptians uh, possess more than a strong uh, uh, military arms? They possess will, they possess uh, decisiveness, they Correct. possess uh, more than that. I mean, uh, no, no doubt. Look, anybody you will talk to on this program or other programs will tell you that the human effort mm. and the motivation was superb. What we're trying to do today.